theoretical chemistry at uh, University of Pisa with Benedetta Menucci, who I think many of you know. So she's been here several times in the last two years. Um, he is now an assistant professor at the University of Pisa in the chemistry department. Yes. Uh, Lorenzo's interests are in uh, studying photochemistry of biological systems, uh, development of methods for QMM, polarizable QMM methods. Uh, in the afternoon today, uh, from 2.30 to 4.30, he's going to give a more of a ped pedagogical lectures on uh, more methodology behind QMM. Uh, so I encourage all of you to come to that. Uh, so Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Um, thank you everyone for being here. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, photoactive proteins and how we can learn about them with multi-scale strategies. So, um, is this is working. Okay, so multi-scale, uh, so photoactive proteins, photoresponsive proteins, there are a lot of them in general, they are some kind of protein complexes with pigments, so protein containing chromophore that absorb light and do something. Okay? So they use the they employ the light energy to activate some kind of function. And so here are a few examples. So most of these are photoreceptors and this is a light harvesting complex. So I will talk about photoreceptors first and then about light harvesting complexes. So let's start with photoreceptors. Uh, so in photoreceptor the, the absorption, the energy uh, absorbed from light is used to activate biological signals. Uh, so usually these complexes have a resting state or dark state where they live usually and then when they absorb light they do some kind of photochemistry and in some way through some conformational changes in the protein they end up in a signaling state. So then the signaling state for, could be something you see from crystallography. So you know that, for example, this complex opens in some way, and also this one opens in some way. Uh, or maybe you don't really know what happens. So there are different kinds of photoreceptors. I chose the three families we, we have been studying. So one is the blue light using flavin photoreceptors, these are very small, this is not an entire protein, it's just a protein domain. Um, now there is phytochromes, and another one is orange coordinate protein. And these are kind of different, they have different uh, photochemistry, and they have different activation mechanisms, and, and different function also. Um, so in the photoreceptors, what you have is usually this photocycle that starts with the absorption of a photon and then some photo photochemistry at the level of the chromophore. Uh, and then you have some changes after this photochemistry which propagate to the immediate uh, neighbor. So that would be the protein pocket. And then in some way also to the entire protein. So we have some we can think about the skin like this, so where we have, initially we have this dark state, then on the femtosecond to picosecond time scale, you have light absorption and photochemistry. So we start from the, the time zero is light absorption. So you have, immediately you have some kind of photochemistry. So you have some changes in the chromophore these changes propagate in the, I, I would say, nanosecond, picosecond to nanosecond time scale to the immediate protein pocket. And then, after a while, you will have conformational changes that are propagated to the entire protein. And then here you can have interactions with other proteins and uh, propagation of the biological signal. So we, we need a way to describe all of these. And you see that it's complicated because we have different length scales and also different time scales. Um, so 
one of the questions is how do we get from the dark to the light state? And this is something that combines the questions you have for the activation of normal uh, proteins, normal receptors, and the question you have from uh, photochemistry in biological uh, environments. So one question is what happens to the chromophore, and this just happens just after light absorption. But another question is uh, how is the protein coupled to the chromophore? So how the protein affects the activation process of the chromophore, uh, and then how does all this structural changes propagate to the entire protein? So these are different questions, and we kind of have to integrate different methods to answer all of them. So if we go back to the um, scheme here, so when we work we look at photochemistry, we will need some kind of excited state molecular dynamics to understand what happens in the photochemistry. So this would be molecular dynamics in a protein pocket. And here the protein is very important, I will show you later. And then we, we need to understand what happens later. So unless we have some very clear idea of what needs to happen, um, we need some methods that don't give you a strong bias on the reaction coordinate, on the reaction mechanism. So we could start from ground state, um, totally unbiased molecular dynamics, and then, of course, when we need to go to longer time scales, we need to do some enhanced sampling, so to include, introduce some biases in the, in the dynamics. So this would be a multi-scale workflow that is not just a multi-scale in, in the space dimension, but it's also multi-scale in the time dimension. So we have to integrate different methods to get to different time scales. So, uh, so just to clarify, so in your scheme, the ground state is what is used for the sampling to do the excited state. The ground state is used for the sampling to do the excited state, but also after the photochemistry, we, we have some dynamics that happens in the ground state. Ah, so after the activation. Yes. Okay. So, uh, I will start from one example that is the bacterial phytochrome. So, uh, these phytochromes are composed uh, of three different domains, and the chromophore is kind of an, at the interface between all of these domains in a pocket. Uh, these phytochromes have an inactive state, which is called PR, because it absorbs red light. And usually the active sta state is PFR, because it absorb absorbs far red light. And it is known, um, the structure of these two systems is known. So this is a structure from 2016. Um, and what, it, what else is known that it, is that it, there is uh, a isomerization of a double bond at the chromophore level. Um, so what, is not, was, what was not known is was exactly what happens from the beginning to the end. So you know like the snapshots at the beginning of the photoactivation in the dark state, you know what happens, you, you know how the system ends up, <coughs> you don't really know what happens in, the, in, in, the, in between. Um, and there are several changes you can see, because uh, apart from this opening, you also have a refolding of this part, which is called the tongue of the, of the protein. So it's kind of a complex process. And it's known that different uh, steps occur at different, completely different timescales. So this would be the, the photocycle. So you have this PR state, and in, you excite this PR in, in the uh, picosecond time scale. You have some photochemistry, and you end up in this Lumi R state. And later it was understood that this Lumi R is composed by different 
states. So we have an early intermediate and late intermediate separated in by nanoseconds. So there are some changes, it's not even very clear what they are. And then you have a much slower change in the mi microsecond time scale to another intermediate that's called MITAR, and again another change in the millisecond time scale to the final uh, light state, which is PFR. Then the PFR can go back to the PR by thermal reversion or by absorbing a far red so um, this is kind of complicated. So we started from the photochemistry. Uh, and for the photochemistry, we use surface hopping. I don't think I have to explain uh, how surface hopping works to this audience. But basically, um, the ground state nuclear wave packet is discretized, let's say, into uh, a classical ensemble. So it's represented by a classical ensemble, and this classical ensemble is excited and then can uh, move on the excited state potential energy surface. And especially in this kind of system, we can have a crossing or a conical intersection where we have some of the uh, structure of the, of the trajectories going to the ground state via going back via non-reactive path to where they started, and some others are reactive and go forward towards um, another configuration. So uh, how we do this, we start from a classical molecular dynamics of the entire system. This is in the order of microseconds. Um, so the idea is to sample the geometries of the dark state in a reasonable way. But then we need to, to sample the chromophore, and we have to be uh, more accurate on the chromophore, at the chromophore level. So what we do is we cut a part of the system which is very, very large. Um, and we use, here we used normal QMMM. Um, and we use for Q, as a QM level a semi-empirical level with um, this FOMO CASI um, level, which allows us to use semi-empirical in conjunction with multi-reference method. So we, we use a CAS multi-reference method, but with, let's say, the semi-empirical cost. And this uh, FOMO, which means um, fluctuation of fluctuating occupation molecular orbitals allows us to use a small active space to include the most relevant uh, configurations. So after the ground state sampling, we do the uh, surface hopping and we are able to use to, to simulate a lot of, of trajectories because the semi-empirical level is not really expensive. Um, and we projected this uh, trajectory onto this two-dimensional plane containing these two dihedral angles. And so what we see is that some trajectories are reactive, so they go here. They started here, they, they are going here. Some are non-reactive, they come back to where they started. Uh, but they basically sample this region of the space. So you can see that very well that these two dihedrals are correlated with one another. So when you rotate V6, which is the double bond in the ground state, you also rotate the adjacent single bond. <coughs> so this mechanism is in known. Your, the, in the QMMM, the QM is periodic? No. So this is all non-periodic. The hop, even the MM. Yes. So it's a cluster. It's a club. It's a big cluster. It's a big so cluster that you've carved out. Exactly. From the classical, and it includes solvent as well. It includes uh, water molecules up to this sphere, 
And how, and basically, how, how thick is your uh, your mm buffer? I think it's thirty Armstrong, more or less. Okay. And basically, we can restrict or just freeze the outer layer. Yeah. So we don't have. I mean, for short, let's say, uh, dynamics, this is fine. And then, since all of this is frozen, after we can go back and put this back into the. So, uh, the are you want to say more about this formal CAS SCI? So. Uh, mm, well, not no. really. But so, no, so, um, so, you still have to choose an active space. You have to choose an active space. But basically, um, so this formal uses fluctuating occupations. Uh -huh. So even at the SCF level, you kind of describe correctly when Homo and Lumo are close together. So in this way, you start from an SCF level where your frontier orbitals, like three and three, are fine, and then you can use CAS-CI. We don't do CAS-SCF because even at the semi-empirical level it would be too costly. So what's the cost of this? So, um, now I don't remember because I didn't run these simulations, but you can do in days or weeks, you can do hundreds of simulations. I see. Maybe here we, we run thousands of simulations because the Giacomo who did all this work is very precise. <laughs> precise. He wanted to have a very good statistics, so to run a lot of simulations. So, uh, and sorry, and uh, where is this implemented? This, uh, so this is this code is um, Giovanni Galucci's code. Ah, okay. But this so this is based on a version of Mopac that we thought it was. Uh, not free, but then it ends up that it's almost open source. So this can, this will be open source in some time. Okay, so this is the trajectory you get. There's one trajectory. So as you can see, we start with, with hydrogen bonds of this ring with this water and this histidine. And then after a while, you will have, you need to rotate the double bond, which is this one, but also this ring cannot rotate completely. It has to stay more or less in the same position because the pocket is crowded here. So right now you see that it rotates, it doesn't rotate 180 degrees to isomerize, because the D file, the adjacent bond, can rotate in the other direction. So, in the end, what you get is this <coughs> CH, which was pointing downwards here, and in the end it points upwards. So, the chromophore is bounded covalently? This chromophore is bounded covalently to the protein here. On this side. So you cannot have a huge rearrangement of the ring because there is the protein around it. So the, the protein pocket is kind of crowded, so it doesn't allow this ring to rotate completely. So the other dihedra here has to rotate in the opposite direction to complete the isomerization. So this would be, initially, we have this D6 that is 0 degrees, and we go almost to 180. But in the meantime, this other dihedral has to reduce to allow the photoisomerization, the isomerization, without moving the entire ring. So actually, the, the ring here rotates by just about 50 degrees. So this mechanism is called hula hop, uh, and it's a mechanism that was recognized to be important when you need to have a photoisomerization 
in a crowded environment. Because it allows a 180 change of the double on the hydra without rotating the entire, an entire part of the molecule by 180 degrees. Okay, so then we get to the photoproduct. Um, to characterize this photoproduct, we want uh, to run again a molecular dynamics. And okay, and we thought this would be an early intermediate, so let's do um, again QMMM dynamics at the same empirical level to fit the same. QMMM partition we had, so we always use AM1, but now we are in the ground state, we don't need to do with reference, we are in the ground state in a position where the ground state is far from the excited state, so we do normal SCF, semi-empirical in AM1 level, together with MM. So actually we, do, we did this with Amber, which has much faster implementation of normal semi-empirical QMMM, so we can do nanoseconds, okay? And then we characterize this uh, early intermediate. So what we see is that, for example, we have an important interaction with this tyrosine. So right now, in this intermediate, this NH group can make a hydrogen bond with the, with the tyrosine, which was not possible in the dark state. So this interaction kind of stabilizes this intermediate. Okay, then what we did was to compute the IR spectrum of the chromophore only, actually only of this part, on these geometries, so on the intermediate and on the dark PR state. And then we computed the different spectrum. So this would be intermediate minus dark, which can be compared with light minus dark experiments. So the positive signals, let's say they come from the light state, so from the intermediate, and the negative signals come from the dark state, from the initial state. And what we see is that we can reproduce this change in the carbonyl stretching, which is one of the characteristics of this intermediate state. So we, we are able to validate this structure. So then we, ne we need to go further and see what happens after this nanosecond. So, so, just to understand, so how exactly do you get these IR spectra from the different structures? You optimize them. Yes, we so okay. we, we re-optimize because for the IR we need to do DFT mm -hmm. at least in a reasonably accurate basis, with a reasonably accurate basis set. So we sample from these ground state trajectories of the intermediate, we do the same with the dark state, um, then we optimize and we compute the IR spectra of the two things, and we do the difference. Um, so, okay. I, just on, on the experiments, uh, only probe this frequency range? Do they have anything going to lower frequencies? I think they do, but the problem is here we have uh, signals from all parts of the yeah, protein, right, exactly. which make things much more complicated. So, experimentally, they are Yes. How low? I don't remember, I think 1200. Okay. So still high, it's not so No, not much lower, Sorry. I think not much lower. Um, and of course here you have to combine experiments in H2O, D2O, uh, and then experiments with different isotopic substitutions to assign better which signals from comes from which part of the protein. Or chromophore. Okay, um, so then we want to see what happens next, and we know that the uh, early to late Lumiere, Lumiere conversion occurs in 0.4 microseconds, so 400 nanoseconds, 
we cannot use QNMM anymore, so we use just standard MM dynamics in an unbiased fashion. So we start from different, uh, we started from different photo products. We ran QMMM dynamics. Now we run uh, regular MM dynamics for in the microsecond uh, time scale, and we see what happens between the beginning and the end. So what we see is that um, if we look at this arginine, it, after a while, so not in the early, but in the late intermediate, it interacts with OD, which is this oxygen here. Um, and then, if we look at the number of hydrogen bond, a number of contacts be between uh, this arginine and this aspartate, so here we would have a salt bridge, we see that in the late, we have more likely, larger likelihood of fewer contacts. So this interaction becomes weaker, which is interesting because this residue belongs to the tongue and has uh, to go away at some point because in the light state, in the final light state, this interaction is not there. This residue is somewhere else. So what we see weakening is a weakening of this salt bridge, um, which is a prelude of what has to come next. So um, we, we are still working, not me, on the next step of the photocycle. Okay, another example I wanted to show you is flavin photoreceptors, and in particular, BLAF domains. There are different flavin photoreceptors. If we look at the ones that are small domains inside larger proteins, we have these love domains and BLAF domains. So in love domains, the photo activation is, I, I wouldn't say straightforward, but easy to understand because we have a cysteine here, and in the light state, there is a cysteine adduct. So it's really easy to see what happens and then how this new bond, the new covalent bond that forms, can activate conformational changes. So, but in blood domains, we really don't know what happens. <coughs> and actually, we don't know the structure of the light activity state. What we know is some spectroscopic data. So, but we have even more problems with, uh, with these um, domains because the first structures <coughs> that have been resolved for blood domains were from this upper protein, so blood domain of the upper protein, so this is just a small domain in the entire protein. Um, so they solved the structure of these domains, but in two groups got two different structures. And the difference between this structure is that we have a different uh, residue in the pocket, but also we have a different position, a different orientation for this gluten. But one could say we don't see hydrogens in the X-ray structures, and also O and NH2 look very similar. So actually, the X-ray resolution of these experiments is too low to determine what is the orientation. So they just guessed, okay? So they guessed that this O and H is a hydrogen bond. So, okay, there has to be a hydrogen bond, so the oxygen has to be on this side. Here, no hydrogen bond, so we, we, we put it in on the other side. Okay, but then the question is, what is the real dark structure? So, um, and the other question is, how does the photoisomerization, photoactivation work? And different mechanisms have been proposed starting involving exactly that glutamine that we don't know, whose orientation we don't know. Um, so what we 
the, the, the fact that we don't know which is the dark state is problematic because then we cannot say which is the mechanism if we don't know where we start. Um, so one of the mechanisms that have been proposed start from the glutamine in this orientation, so the, the oxygen is towards the tyrosine, and then there would be a proton coupled electron transfer where we have electron transfer from tyrosine to the clubbing, um, followed by proton transfers, and then back electron transfer uh, back to uh, tautomeric glutamine. So this was proposed in 2008, and still people didn't really accept it. So uh, what is actually known is what are the light induced changes in the spectroscopy. So we have a small redshift in the UV visible, which cannot be explained by chemical changes in the flavoring, for example, and also a small shift in the uh, frequency of this carbon. And basically, this is it. We have also uh, NMR, which was really difficult to assign. And also here we have small changes in this hydrogen, in this proton here. So the question is, from this knowledge, how can we get to the light state? So we started from characterizing the dark state with molecular dynamics. So we characterize the two structures and what we found is that if you do MD, uh, the glutamine rotates back to the same position it had in this other structure. So this is because there is no hydrogen bond to the tryptophan. So there is no, way, no reason why the opposite structure, opposite orientation should be stabilized. So we found, found out that after a while we get always to this structure here. Um, so we have this flipping of the glutamine, while in this other structure we don't have significant changes in the microseconds time scale. Uh, so what we get is that the orientation of the glutamine is the same in the two structures. So we are sure of one thing, that this is the orientation of the glutamine. But is this true? Does it go back and forth? So it starts by going back and forth, but then after a while, it's stabilized. I can show you later. Um, and since it can go back and forth very quickly, initially, this, degrees of, this degree of freedom, the rotation of the glutamine, is fast, which means that just rotation cannot be a photoactivation mechanism. Because if you just rotate the glutamine, it will go back really easily. It, it would be too short-lived to explain a light adapted state. Okay, so to understand which is the, really the dark structure, we used uh, NMR and we computed the chemical shifts of uh, the flowering protons and the protons in these residues here. And what we found, so the ones that we have in common in the two structures, while tryptophan is not, is only in one of the two structures. And what we found is that in the tryptophanine structure, so in the structure where we have tryptophan, we have a very, very overshielded proton for this asparagine, which is not compatible with experiments. Whereas here we have much better correlation. So, so uh, what, is, what does that mean, overshielded? So, the, um, so this is the, the chemical shift. Mm -hmm. The chemical shift of this proton is very low of, uh, for NNH2 okay. in, uh, in an amide. Uh, in, in, the, in the calculation? Yes. So while in the experiment it's normal, let's say. But that's because you're, you're doing a cluster, maybe, no? Well, it, it, it is in the sense that um, so what we found out is that this tryptophan is responsible for the shielding because you have 
So this button is exactly above the, re the aromatic ring. So the ring current shields this button. So I see. I see. the conclusion here is that this, this tryptophan cannot be here because otherwise in the experiment they would observe a uh, downshifted uh, yeah. proton. Uh, okay. So from this we concluded that either there is some problem in the assignment of the NMR spectra or this is not the correct structure. Okay, so let's go back to the photoactivation mechanism and the uh, proton coupled electron transfer uh, that was um, proposed, which involves two radical intermediates. And these have been detected for other proteins of the same family, but not for APA. So our, the question is, does this, this specific protein have a completely different mechanism, or does it have the same mechanism? And so no radicals have been detected. So we try to understand uh, what is the excited state dynamics of this system. So we combined excited state self-consistent field uh, QM with polarizable LM. We use that SCF. So excited state SCF because it's fast, because it's the same as a, almost the same thing as a ground state SCF. Um, and it can describe city states much better than the visit. So we combine this with uh, polarizable MM, with amoeba. And so we have this delta SCF ami uh, amoeba coupling. And the, the nice thing is about this is that both the QM and the QM environment interactions are described on the same basis as you would the ground state. Um, so for delta CF, you decide um, excitation. You build a determinant with a single excitation, or even double if you need. And then uh, you solve this has consistent field in a way that you don't collapse back to the ground state. Um, so we did this and, and we, we simulated the dynamics in the CT state. So we, we, we built a CT state by moving an electron from the tyrosine to the flavin, and we saw what happens. And what happens is basically we have a first proton transfer very, very fast. And then after a while, we have a second proton transfer. So we end up with this glutamine tautomer that then uh, rotates quite quickly in the picosecond time scale. And we get to this neutral Dirac. So we start from a charge transfer uh, situation, we have proton transfer and then we get to a neutral di radical, and then we have this rotation of the gluten, which arrives here in this situation. <coughs> then what we uh, did was we assumed that at some point we have back electron transfer, so we again uh, use ground state this now, this time simulations to uh, follow what happens after back electron transfer. And we have, again, um, two proton transfers. So first from the flavin to the glutamine and then to the tyrosine. So the, the flavin and the tyrosine uh, end up the same as they were before. But the glutamine is now in tautomeric form. <coughs> so this, without giving too much input in the dynamics, we get the same mechanism as the one that was proposed in 2008. Uh, uh, what would be the time scales of the back electron transfer? And this is a difficult question because we, can, we could not compute it. But, and it's not known experimentally? We know that it's faster than forward electron transfer which, because... Which is how fast? Forward? Um, I think it's hundreds of picoseconds. 
forward is 100 to and yeah. back is faster. Has to be faster because otherwise you would see the value first. I see. So if we put everything back together, this is the observe one of the trajectories. So we have the first proton transfer, the, the two proton transfer, then the glutamine uh, rotation, which is a bit slower, then nothing much happens here. So it's we stabilize this thing and then we, we go back, reverse proton couple electron transfer, and then this is the final situation. So and the question is, how do we know, okay, let's skip this, how do we know that the, the structure is good? So we compared light and dark structures and we computed different properties. So again, we have to look at the IR and especially the carbonyl, UV visible and NMR. So UV visible, we get basically the same different differences, especially if we, if we look at the first absorption band, as in the experiment. And we could understand that this difference is only due to the change in the glutamine tautomeric form. So if you remove the glutamine, they are the same. Uh, and then we also have basically very similar differences both in the uh, NMR and in the IR. So in the in the proton um, H3 proton um, chemical shift and in the IR frequency. So we change we, we predict correctly basically the, the three main changes. So we are quite sure that this is the correct uh, light state structure. So then we can study what happens in the light state, again with normal molecular dynamics, MM, and we see some changes, especially this change in the arginine position, which then interacts with this aspartate. Um, so, and also a shift of the uh, flooding. And then this helps us understanding what could be the uh, activation mechanism. So we have a sliding of the flooding because of the tautomer. And then this arginine detaches from here and then interacts with this aspartate. And this aspartate was uh, considered as a putative site of signal transduction towards the other domains of the protein. So maybe this is the, the piece that is missing from the activation. And then there are additional changes in the, the sheet region. Okay, so summary from, I would say that this is an entire summary because it's almost, uh, we are almost finished. So we have a multi-scale strategy for photoreceptors that is not just multi-scale in space, but also multi-scale in time. Um, and one of the important things that is often overlooked is characterizing the structure. So the dark state, let's be sure that the structure we have is the correct one. And so for the phytochrome we have Hula twist isomerization, which is a space-saving photoisomerization mechanism. And then for the <coughs> proton-coupled electron transfer mechanism, um, we saw that this mechanism works for APA, so which ends up in the tautomerization of the glutamine. Um, and then also the, also the rotation of the glutamine. And the other important thing is spectroscopic characterization, where possible, helps us validate the intermediates. And then what we still need is longer time scales to get to the uh, final state, for example, in the phytochrome, PFR, and for APA, we need the full protein to understand the full activation.
not just one domain, and also understanding the thermal reversion to the dark state. So I will skip everything else here. Uh, and then let's go to the, to the acknowledgements. So especially Dr. Giacomo Salvadori who worked on the phytochrome and Patrizia Mazzeo who worked on APA, Dr. Shaima Hashem also who worked on APA and uh, Mattia Valdazza and Kieran Ottoli uh, uh, who worked on the implementation of everything here, all the let's say QMM and Paul related implementation and of course Professor Filippo Riparini who also worked on the QMM and Paul implementation and Professor Benedetta Menucci uh, and thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much Lorenzo Very interesting, very complicated systems <laughs> uh, Questions? I have many questions but I been asking many during the talk, so I will stop and let others. And this technical question you said the service subject was done with a modified version of the MOPAC? Yes. So, this is a version of the MOPAC code which was modified and let's say improved by Professor Ganucci and Professor Persico in Pisa, and they included the surface hopping, all the surface hopping part into the code. But the, the code is also interfaced with uh, Newtonet. So it's Mopac in, interface with Tinker for the MM part and also containing all the surface hopping with MD code and so on. Can you, can you go back to the system in which you observed the electron transfer? Yes. Uh, here, yes. If I understood correctly, you are doing delta CCF mm -hmm. in the uh, excited state, mm -hmm. and then after the two proton transfer, you switch to the ground state. We switch to the ground. We okay. If we go to this uh, charge transfer state, so let's call it the radical state. Right. Then we stay on this state. So this is because the delta CF is almost a diabatic method. So we follow the state with the radical current. So at some point, this state becomes the ground state. Okay, but you are not doing surface swapping here. No. Okay. So we, we are working almost in a diabatic level, diabatic scale. Okay. So, which allows us to use DFT without, I mean, to go from excited to ground state. So this is. Delta CCF with DFT. It's yes. Not a semi -empirical... No, this is the, this is DFT. So it's exactly the same. I, I will explain this after the, the method more in detail. It's basically the same thing as ground state as CF, but you force the system to occupy this orbital. I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah uh, general question. No, it's not my field. So uh, at one point, a couple of times actually, you mentioned the time scales, you showed the time scales. Mm -hmm. So from the time the photon is absorbed up to, absorb up to the time you see a photo reaction, it was like a millisecond, right? So you said the biological reaction happens in about a millisecond. Um, so well, it depends on which one. <laughs> Can you show one of, I think it was one of your earliest slides that in very slides. Okay, so for example in the uh, photocycle. Yeah, absolutely. The time scale, 
Yeah, you kind of emphasized on that on the previous slide that the time is spent for seeing any biological reactions like in Is that right? Did I get it correctly? Uh, you, you mean that biological signaling? Well, yes. Yeah. Because you, you have to end up in the final light activated structure. This is something well known from the biology of microorganisms, for example, that it's fastest time scale for biological signaling from for photoactivated microorganisms, yeah. basically. Is it like in this again? It cannot be faster? Uh, I think it, it depends on the system, but basically the, the, I would say the reason why this is so slow, and actually there is another photoreceptor I, I didn't have the time to talk about, which is much slower than this. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason this is so slow is that you need to funnel the <coughs> Well, on, 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 a, uh, on one hand, you have to propagate the change that is on the chromophore towards the entire protein, right. but you have to funnel it Absolutely. to activate the correct conformational change. Just so I understand, that's exactly my question. Uh, it is as slow in biology. Do we know that? I, mean, you I don't think you can uh, see this. Uh, I have more examples on light harvesting complexes, but uh -huh. it's a completely different thing. Um, the reason it's difficult is that if you are in a cell, there are a lot of things happening. And the actual signaling, I would say the slowest process would be um, this protein interacting with something else. Right. So here in the phytochrome, you have... so. You usually, in vitro, you usually study this. Mm. And this is a truncated construct, because here you will have another domain, which is histidine kinase. Um, so you would have one here and one there. Mm. Um, and these other domains are the uh, catalytic domains. So when you open this, you open the catalytic domains so they can do something. So another general question is this time. Please. So um, maybe you mentioned that I didn't ca uh, catch this, but um, these are not single photon events, right? So how many photons do this? I have some background in polymer physics. So this amount of configurational change is a lot, you know, it requires a lot of energy, but at the same time, of course, you're exchanging energy and entropy free energy with the solvent and everything. So it might compensate for that, really. But, I mean, based on the amount of photon, the number of photons that are absorbed, so do we know anything, how many photons are needed? Okay. okay, this is a controversial question, because uh -huh. um, not in this one, but in this orange carton protein, there is evidence that it's a two-photon process. Two but for the other um, foot receptors, I think it's assumed it's a single photon process. So, um, if it's a multi-photon process, I would say um, you either have a two-photon process right at the beginning, which is, I would say, rather unlikely, or you have first something that is a photoreaction with one photon and then another photon and another photoreaction. Um, but um, so if, you, if you study this... is between one or two. Between or one or two, yes. Yeah, because for me, you know, um, coming from a very different background, controversy, personal controversy would be like, you have a very complicated landscape how a single photon can catalyze all this, you know, because so in photosynthesis, we know how this works. It's a very clean and pure basic system that works based on quantum mechanics. But here, uh, you will have the solvent, you have you know, a lot of noisy material around you. And a lot of yeah, that's for sure. There, there is how a single photon would be able to catalyze all this. That, I mean, that's just a personal question for me because I'm coming from a different background. You might be very well know uh, how this happens. I think. Well, you don't need, so this is kind of a 
cascade reaction. Uh -huh. So you you do some photochemistry and you end up uh, here in a high free energy state and then it, it's all downhill from there. So the landscape is not that complicated. But it is complicated, but on the, on the direction Basically, the, the main thing is that bridge, you know? From going from step one to step two is the key thing there. Yeah. yeah. I think you, you do something very drastic locally. Yeah. yeah. That's really out of equilibrium. And then, and then it's down this is right. yes, because for example here you so the, the change might not seem very large but mm. so but this is a isomerization so now these can only go this way basically so I, I you know there are similar events in quantum biology like uh, tunneling events you know for example if you look at um, so there are, there are like protein synthesis processes that can happen very fast, you know, like it's uh, like a small, you know, animal can go very fast over a period of, I don't know, a few days, you know, understand that kind of thing. So it looks like um, basically it's the quantum mechanics at work, right? It takes you through a barrier which will be classically not unavailable. Yeah, here basically you can sort of going from step one to step two is what I mean. Yeah. So I think here the, the big uh, jump you have because the photon has a lot of energy. So it's, I don't know, two ele electron volts. No, no, that wasn't my point actually. So that, my point was actually that the photon doesn't have, the photon that we are talking about, I mean, I can't go, it cannot be extract, right? No, it doesn't but, have so but much it's... energy. But uh, so I have to okay because I'm coding from memory. I can tell you that. But some some tunneling basically processes make a whole range of phases space available for you. Quantum yeah. biology there are processes that are very weird because before that tunneling you cannot really uh, mm. see any process happening. But when you tunnel, it doesn't require so much energy. But once that happens, it's really interesting in, in the quantum sense. Then everything goes down here, and you see huge, you know, and fast process. Like, you know, have you seen these uh, these things for frogs? You know, they grow from uh, infant. What, what are these infant frogs are called? You know, tadpoles. 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 Yeah. Right, exactly. They grow and become an adult frog in 14 days because this process keeps happening. It's a tunneling in the, the muscle tissue. Yeah, on the quantum. Tunneling of what? Well, it is a kind of a CSAN trans transition, you know, a particular type of enzyme that produces the proteins. So I can't say any other things. These are like infield videos, but very nice. So it looks to me like that. Because the first thing you know, the initial energy, single photon is not really that large to actually take care of all of it. It has to be some element. I think. Of Okay, I would say it's enough because this photon energy is much more than the, the I mean, all the protein, all the system here is made in a way that there are barriers, okay, but these barriers can be large, but the, the photon energy is much, much larger. But I think this has nothing to do with quantum tunneling, really? quantum value. I mean, the, the point is that uh, excited state chemistry, the potential energy surfaces along different modes, changes drastically. So things that were very high so barrier become barrierless. It's very nonlinear, like chaotic, right? This is what you mean. Because, you know, uh, if you sum the number of hydrogen bonds you have, the number of the entropy you have to actually, I don't know, gain or release, of breaking and so many basically uh, energy components that you have. I don't know how a single photon can take that back. Yeah, I understand your point. Uh, I would say this uh, free energy landscape is not random. Uh -huh. it, I think it's uh -huh. right. kind of optimized. Something very, something very specific. I think right. so, yes. I understand. 
Yes, I would say so. Because basically, okay, this is on the excited state, okay. But then here you have a lot of heterogeneity, but then you can see that after a change here, what happens is that this part weakens. And then this is what needs to happen to get right to the light state. So I think it's a large free energy, a high dimensional free energy uh, landscape, but it's funneled. So it's exactly it's not tunneling definitely. This yeah. is not known to be a tunneling here. No, no, no. no. It's an exaggeration chemistry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, I ask you my questions later. Okay. So, Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll see you at two thirty. Okay. Perfect. <laughs>